hear from the man himself. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Mark Thompson to the Stone Fellows Leadership Speaker Series. Over to you, Mark. Well, well, thank you so much. My goodness, my uh, I'm, I'm so delighted and honored to be, to be having being pursued so persistently and insistently during this this period. I, I love being back uh, with with all of you, and it's an honor to be with the you know, among the best and the brightest there at Sloan and MIT. I, um, I I I feel kind of humbled in your presence, and I'm glad that everyone is safe uh, and sound. And uh, the, the level of communication and the intimacy of this setting is a great equalizer. Everyone here has a front row seat. And so I'm really hoping each of you will, will step up and ask questions today. I'll be watching for those on chat as we invite our esteemed guests to speak so that we can make sure that we answer as many questions as possible and that we're in a position where if we don't cover all of the questions, we we'll want to make sure that we stay in touch so that we can follow up on each and every one of your uh, your questions uh, today. I, I feel a little bit like you're all on this great adventure because some of you are starting an adventure wondering what you got yourselves into. Others here are further along in the path saying, oh great, I'm just finishing at the time we've gone from a bull to a bear market. And, and others are mid-career saying, my goodness, what did I sign up for? I, you better be careful what you wish for. I now have more authority, more responsibility, more accountability. Wow, that was great when the wind was at our back. Now, this is what we were called to do, right? This is, this is what really differentiates this. And I see you all as superheroes. You're like Indiana Jones in the temple of Zoom. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted that we can be in this kind of more intimate setting uh, to have a conversation about it. And here you asked me to come and speak, and what did I do? I've been Zoom bombing you here with some esteemed guests. And the reason I did that is, is just for three questions I want you to ask yourself. I'm a CEO coach. I spend my time being privileged to be with people who play on the field at a better level of gameplay than I ever have, that, that I be, I'm able to observe people doing things in an extraordinary ways. And, and I just want you to ask yourself three questions. The first principle here, and the, and the reason I needed to bring these esteemed guests with me is because I need help. I mean, I really need help. I don't know about you, but we all need to have the vulnerability to know that we need to help and we need to grow each and every day. Nobody does anything worthwhile alone. It's not about me. It's not about each of us individually. It's about who we can recruit to the task. And so I don't know about you, I just want you to ask yourself, who are your mentors? Who are you going to recruit to this dream? Who's going to share a point of view that could support you and uh, and really help show you the way? And so for every, every year that's passed, after 40 years of being in business, I've always looked to my mentors, like the people in this room, like Hubert, like Hortense, like the other guests that you'll meet in a moment. I, I really feel that's a critical question always to ask. Who is your personal board of directors? Who, who's going to be there in, in that circle? And don't waste the crisis. This is a great time to do the three minute ask and ask for that support and ask for that advice. And as Hortense and, and Hubert know, I ask for their advice all the time. Uh, that never changes. The second question I wanna make sure that you ask yourself is about scale. And that's the fact that we all as individuals have been called to a, to a moment in time, I think, where every CEO or every C-suite executive, every leader is not the expert in the room. We are all here because we are to be facilitators, as Alan Mulally would say. We're, we're here, here to be the coaches, to rally a team of people who exceed our capacities and who are able to come together and, and deliver uh, great outcomes. It used to be that the, we were the smartest person in the room when we were hired beyond our capacity to lead. We are really here to think about how much we can learn from the people around us that's the second question and the third question i just want to ask have you asked yourself about the role and the reason you want to be leading uh, and the reason you want to be in uh, taking the steps towards leadership in an organization i think just about the time you think you're the boss you realize you aren't that the the, the role of the leader is to to know that we are here really to help facilitate the many stakeholders in the organization. We are, we are really all about being in a place where we realize that in most cases, the board of directors, not the CEO is the boss. 
So there you have a group of executives who contribute so much. You have employees, you have the stakeholders and the customers of the organization. So nobody does anything like this alone. And how are we really embracing and empowering our stakeholders? And nobody knows this better than Hubert and Hortense. Hubert has been the, the CEO who stepped in at a crucible for Best of Eye, uh, the, the individual who took the big box store concept and reinvented it in an era when online competition was heating up. And uh, you have, are now in, a, in the role of executive chairman at Best Buy. You're on the board of uh, Ralph Lauren. You're, uh, you're vice chair of the business council. Um, nobody's had a, a greater opportunity to both face crucibles and challenges and also evangelize the values of the organization as, as you have, Uber. So I thought I would start with, with you. Maybe you could talk about some of the themes that you may have read, uh, many of you in the in Harvard Business Review. Um, Uber, could you talk a little bit about what it's like to step into the role when you realize that it, it's all about having to lead a transformation in, in times of, of, of even crisis, I would say. I do this, Mark. So technical question. Uh, I think I'm now the host and I have to click to let people into the room. So if somebody wants to take over this role, that will allow more people to come into the room. Uh, we are sorry. managing. Yeah. We, we, we're doing it, don't we? we yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Not to worry. worry. We were just sharing power with you. We were trying to role model. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I the fact that nobody does it alone. <laughs> I felt a huge responsibility. Oh, uh, yes. No, no, no. Uh, Mark, yeah. thank you for sharing your wisdom I think in five minutes you gave us so much about the role of the leader not to be the smartest person in the room but to create an environment in which others can be you know successful and being vulnerable i think these lessons mark absolutely applied when i became the ceo of best buy in 2012 and when we were supposed to uh, uh, to die and, and we went yeah. from turnaround to growing the, the the company and the principles that we went through at the time uh, I think apply very much during this incredible crisis. It's the idea that uh, you know you put people first, mm. and in the turnaround, in the turnaround, oftentimes people are focused on cut, cut, cut. No, at Best Buy, we put the emphasis on the blue shirts and empowering the blue shirts, giving them the tools to be successful, including on matching online prices, so that you know we could uh, you know survive in this era of, uh, of Amazon. It's treating profit as an outcome, but not as the north star. Uh, of business and you focus on what do I need to do for all of the stakeholders and in this crisis this is for all of us a completely unprecedented crisis there's absolutely zero blueprint you can check in any manual I don't care whether it's MIT or any other business school in the world there's no blueprint and yet you know we've been faced with so many of these questions should I keep my stores open should I keep my plants open should I keep the offices open? Should I continue to pay the employees? For how long? How do I continue to serve my customers? There's no blueprint for this. Mm. And so I think the question we're being asked is how should we lead in this environment? Uh, my view is that in the context where there's no blueprint, there's principles. And maybe that's what we'll talk about. And the principles from here are around purposeful human leadership. And these are the principles we've employed at Best Buy. Uh, it's about people first and profit as an outcome. It's about purpose. What's, why do we exist as a company and stakeholder management, which is very much with the business roundtable. You know, I think many of us have seen the business roundtable, 181 CEOs of the, the U.S. Uh, uh, greatest companies signed this uh, statement on corporate purpose, which is, uh, the, you know, the primacy of shareholders is over. That was Milton Friedman. Mm. It's all about what noble purpose do we pursue and how do we manage all of the stakeholders? And this crisis is a test of, you know, are we going to live that, uh, that principle? And we'd be happy to talk about it, but that's a long answer to your first question. Well, when you think about that challenge at the time, you had to also think about the business model, I would think. It, it was rather existential. Um, and as you said, you can't anticipate this particular situation that way. But how do you think about having the humility or courage to reinvent a business model and everyone here is looking at various playbooks over time how, how did you go about thinking through what was best and about best buy uh, and the blue shirts and the model and and what you really needed to change so it's interesting because the parallelism is is great the 
when when the business is in a turnaround mode or when we are entering a crisis like the coronavirus crisis you actually don't start with business model and strategy mm -hmm. you start with dealing with the now and so at best buy you know my sense was that there was nothing wrong with our environment in the case of the coronavirus there's lots of, a lot of bad things about the environment but uh, right. we felt that uh, so many of the levers were in our control Mm. So the customer experience we were providing to customers, whether the blue shirts in the stores were helpful, the uh, the quality of the website shopping experience, how fast we would ship, the competitiveness of our prices, our cost structure, all of this was within our control. So the mm. first phase of the turnaround, Mark, which we call Renew Blue, blue is the shirt, the color of the shirt of the blue shirts, was all about operational performance improvement covering all of the stakeholders, the customers, the employees, the vendor partners, uh, the communities in which we operate and, and, uh, and the shareholders and improving with a sense of purpose and, uh, and humanity. So, you know, if you take, you know, typical turnaround, cut, 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 you, you know, people get glorified because of the number of positions they've eliminated, the number of people they've fired. In my view, in a turnaround, you start by focusing on revenue you know, growing the revenue line is uh, allows you to do many things. And as it relates to cost, of course, you have to cut costs. And at Best Buy, we took about $2 billion of cost out. Uh, the first focus is on what I call non-salary expenses. Everything that's not related to compensation and benefit. And at most companies, it's 80% or 70% of the cost structure. So out of the $2 billion, of course, we've taken out probably 75 with non-compensation and benefit related. For example, we sell a lot of TVs. We they're thin, so we break a lot of them. If we can reduce TV breakage, that's a cost saving. Mm. Then we go after compensation and benefits. So healthcare costs are a big cost for companies. And they're growing quickly. How can you have a you know foster well-being and wellness for your employees so that you reduce their healthcare costs? Mm. You go after headcount as a last resort. Because you know, the employees are not the problem in the turnaround, they're the source of the solution. And mm. so if one plus two plus three revenue, non salary expenses and benefits are not sufficient, then you cut, you may cut headcount, but even then you're gonna be careful. So for example, we closed the, the Best Buy Mobile standalone stores at Best Buy in 2017 or 2018, because that made sense. They were mall based small stores. It made sense when you know the iPhone launched, but by 2017, 2018, didn't make any sense. But what we decided to do is try to keep every one of the employees mm -hmm. because they were skilled, they shared our values, and you know we were able to redeploy them within the uh, company. And I think with the coronavirus, we're going to go through three phases. One is dealing with you know shelter in place, which is now. Then there's working on the reopening of the economy, and then finally there's going to be how is my business model changing. The priority that I've seen, like you, I, I, I work with a bunch of CEOs and I observe many of them. The focus in the short term has not been on business model, but how do I deal with, how do I take care of my employees now? Mm -hmm. How do I serve the customers? How do I redefine performance management? It's not about my share price or whether I'm going to hit guidance. This is going to be a time for the business model reinvention, but that's, you don't start with that. Uh, Mark, I cannot hear yeah. you. The, uh, it's, you make such a powerful point because we realize that the only way forward is the strategy, the efforts, and the service provided by the people who are yeah. able to deliver that. And uh, we don't want to cut off our head uh, in the process of, of reducing our, our expenses and, and stepping up in some unique ways. And then having the humility to realize that we may have to continue to reinvent the way we go to market it and the okay. way we deliver those services. Okay. Um, what you're talking about is is how we make sure that we have alignment around those valuable uh, values and the team uh, so that they can deliver those services. Um, we, we have a, a colleague here, Hortense Legetil, who is uh, a best-selling author of a book called Aligned uh, that I saw your endorsement in and an interview with you as well uh, about. Uh, you're sought after uh, for insights by many of the thought leaders and uh, Hortense, uh, the message that you're delivering about her book is called Aligned. Uh, and her book really talks about this idea that we need to be able to bring people together around a common set of, 
of ideas and principles and values. Hortense, could you talk a little bit about what you meant by being aligned, uh, particularly in, in, in light of the crisis that we're in now? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for asking this question. Yes, being aligned today is so much important. What I mean by being aligned is, you know, know yourself first, uh, know your values, come back to your values, to who you are, to your drivers, to, uh, you know, know, know yourself, connect your true self with the leader you're meant to be. So it means, you know, connect with your inner self, really. Who are you? And I think that nowadays with the crisis and everything, the crisis, it's so much important to go back to yourself first, you know? And because if you, if you find, if you know who you are, you are going to, and you know, why you, why you are going to, to go there or why you, uh, what kind of leader you want to be, you, you have your true north. And in, in this time of, uh, you know, turbulence, it's good to have your true north and to know, to know who you are. So this is what I think for, you know, for today. So, and it's re really be at the present moment, go back to yourself. And from there, you, you can navigate. Dubert, mm. have you had times when you had to reevaluate who you are? I mean, you certainly now have transitioned from being giving power and, and coaching to the team. Uh, both of you are coaches now, uh, both Hortense and Hubert. How did you go about redefining your role uh, in this next phase of your career as you're now a director? Um, I'm asking you, Hubert, about that transition of what's next and how you went about deciding that. Since many people here, and, you, and Hortense is suggesting that one might consider you know, why we really want to contribute at various points in our career. So, so the uh, question this is raising, Mark, is what's, what's my purpose in life and, and uh, what's yeah. my identity? Right. So here's the scoop. Even when I was the CEO of Best Buy, I was not the CEO of Best Buy. I was me. This, being the CEO of Best Buy was just a role I had for a while. Yeah. And I tried my best to be the best version of myself being the CEO of Best Buy. But that's not my identity. And that's not my purpose. And I think as we grow in our career, and many of you know, anybody who graduated from the Stone School, you know, as the opportunity to, to do amazing things in the world. But we have to be clear about who we are and what's our purpose. So my pur what is my purpose in life? It's to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to make a positive difference in the world. That was true when I was CEO of Best Buy. And about two years ago, I made the decision that uh, uh, it was time to pass the baton. I'm very proud of having passed the baton to uh, uh, Corey Barry, our new CEO there, and she's doing a fabulous job. Uh, my purpose has not changed. I can now use my next chapter to continue to try to make a positive difference on people around me and use the platform I have to make a positive difference in the world. So very concretely, one of the things I'm passionate about, I think we need a reinvention of business and capitalism around the themes of purpose and humanity. The primacy of shareholders, the, the, you know, Milton Friedman uh, view of the world has been poisonous. And uh, the 21st century is a time where we need to reinvent business. And because of the success of Best Buy in the turnaround, I think I've built a platform where I can, that I can leverage. So I'm writing a book that's coming out uh, next spring, provisionally titled, you know, The Heart of Business. The idea of teaching at, at HEC Paris, which is my, I'm a matter of endowed a chair on purposeful leadership. I'm studying, I'm going to start uh, teaching across the river from MIT. There's this other school mm -hmm. uh, where I think I can, working with others, I can contribute to shaping business education. The way we are successful as CEOs is not because we're the best at spending the four P's of marketing, right? Or calculating an at present value. It's how we can create an environment to uh, unleash, you know, the, the, the effectiveness of many, many people. Uh, coaching and mentoring teams is something I want to do. Uh, so these are the kinds of things. Yeah. And Mark, I couldn't hear you because you were on mute. No, I, I, I was just uh, uh, asking our 
our wonderful daughter uh, whether she wanted to participate and listen in. So I was. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is the great thing. We we beamed into everybody's homes, and I have with, a with the humanity. We invite our families. There's no separation between the business world and our personal lives, which was a big mistake that we made last century. We're going to be a different person at work than at home. No, we have a unity of the person. And we're going to be the best leader. And I think Hortense does a great job of talking about this in her book. If we can be clear about who we are and then be the best and full version of ourselves as we lead companies and uh, building human connections, you know, genuine, authentic, uh, you know, human connections at a company is what fuels human magic. And, and that's not related to NPV calculation. The, um, the, the step that you're taking to help evangelize that, nobody could do that better than uh, a chief executive who's been celebrated as being very successful um, at what he does. And, and you've noticed this, uh, Hortense, as you've observed uh, CEOs in terms of being able to get connected with that sense of purpose. When you're in a, in a crisis particularly, that feels existential. And we're having abundance of time of being sheltered in place. It makes you start to consider that. I mean, what, what, do, what, how do you keep alignment going, Hortense, when you're getting cabin fever uh, or <laughs> when you're hungry? Uh, I mean, it's great for extroverts like um, many of my friends uh, when they can be with everybody every day. And it's great for introverts like me when I can, I can beam in and out of, of contacts like this. What, what's your advice for, for keeping that sense of alignment in these circumstances? Oh, I think... Um, I think that you have to 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 hit the pause button and take your time, take a step back to again think about um, your values, who you are, and what you want to do today. Uh, how do you want to uh, uh, to participate to uh, to the future and to uh, and uh, how you can imagine everything? So listen to your intuition, go back to your role model. And uh, think about you know you you were talking about the mentor. So look at your mentor or you you. I have uh, equals in my. Uh, yes, I think uh, because you're both in the same location. Uh, um, when you speak, it be so mute. begins on you. That would probably help. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah. So, so go back to yourself and uh, to, to, uh, again to think about uh, because when never seen you can go out. anyway. We cannot go outside. So go inside of yourself. You are going to find everything inside of yourself. So refuel. Uh, take time to refuel. To uh, to I don't know. You everybody is refueling this you know different way. You can exercise. Uh, you can meditate, uh, you can listen to music, you can cook, you can do whatever, but spend half an hour uh, per day just to uh, stay with yourself mm. with, without, you know, thinking, thinking and overthinking. Try to focus on what you can change and not, you know, and be at the present moment and not too much at, oh my gosh, what's going to happen in one year, in six months, because we don't know. So we don't know what we don't know. So think about what can I do to, today? And what you can do today is uh, connect with your environment. So, you know, connect with your teams. Um, so every day they need you. You are a role model right now. So you are, as a leader, you are a role model. People are looking at you. So take care of those people. Uh, you know, contact, uh, connect with them every day. At the same time, it's is better because you know like that the people know that they are going to have news from you at 8 a.m every morning so market call you at 8 a.m so you know that you are going to be able to talk about what you have in mind and everything at 8 a.m uh, so as a leader do that try to to make a safe place for your your employees for uh, everywhere everybody is working with you and of course uh, as a manager you cannot manage if you have a lot of employees, uh, not everybody, but what you could do is connect with your, your first team every day, ask your, your manager to, to do the same, to cascade, in fact, to do in cascade, to be sure that everybody in the company, in the organization can be aligned uh, mm -hmm. with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And take time, what, I, what I, I, I do a lot right now is, uh, take, don't, don't be afraid to um, take a lot of time just to listen. 
Uh, so don't go, you know, in a meeting and say, okay, we're going to do that, 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 that. No. The first thing is connect with your people and just say, okay, how are you? How do you feel? How do you feel? And and give time to people to answer, but to really answer, because this is the only way to to help others uh, and to stay connected all together. Because everybody is feeling the same. Everybody has fears today. Everybody is afraid. Like that, like that, like that. Everybody. You cannot say you are not afraid. That's not true. I am afraid too. Everybody is afraid. And especially when you realize that you know, you can really be affected by, by this virus and the economy, we don't know about anything uh, building tomorrow. So when we don't know, uh, okay, go back to yourself again and from yourself, you know, you know, um, connect with, with the environment and others. So it's really human connecting with human. It's really alignment of alignments. So this is, this is yeah, uh, this is things I can. Yeah, we have to start with the others in the room. I know, that's why. <laughs> we, we, uh, you know, we have to start with everyone that we're touching every day, as you say. Um, oh, yes, sorry. No, okay. no, no. <laughs> I <laughs> that, thought it was over. My time oh, was no, over. No, no, no. Well, I, I, I do want to thank you and, and you, Bear, for um, those preliminary thoughts. And we'll be taking questions um, throughout this that we can integrate in the dialogue. This principle of being able to start with yourself and understand why you're being driven to take this path today. And that sense of purpose is more important than ever. And realize that everybody else who's coming to the table, it's your job to find out what they value, believe, uh, and how to respect and integrate them into your, your organization and into the goals and purposes that you want to drive. We have uh, joining us a, a, another great mentor of mine. I, it's a privilege for me to be able to have people who have taught me so much uh, join us today, who have extraordinary experience. Mark Fields, um, I think you're with us now. Mark was uh, CEO of uh, Ford Motor Company. He's now got a, a constellation of CEOs that he's coaching at, at the private equity company that he's uh, a part of. He's got a whole portfolio of, of individuals who are now looking for direction, either being in the first steps of their career uh, or who are mid-career and those who are wondering what they got themselves into. Um, Mark, I, I thought I would start off talking about how you manage uh, the, the transformation uh, that is necessary for yourself and for an organization when it's going through periods like this and, and, and what you're really telling some of the CEOs that you're guiding now based on your extraordinary experience. Thank you for being along, Mark. Well, thank you. Um, I think the, the, the most... Amongst the advice uh, I give folks is in my career at Ford, I usually uh, went into really bad situations and had to make them better. Um, obviously, the biggest one was when we had the Great Recession back in 08 and 09, and we had to completely restructure our North American business. And when you're in this kind of crisis, I think, you know, obviously leadership counts every, like all the time, but in, in this particular time, it counts even the most. And the biggest piece of advice I give is, listen, you want to be as consistent as a leader in a crisis as you are when things are going well, because people will, they're, they're watching you. They're watching you, how you say things, your body language, and folks are really smart. And if you're trying to fool them or you're trying to manipulate them or, you know, try and tell it's been a different reality, people will pick up on that, you know, in a nanosecond. So just be yourself and be consistent, you know, every day, even though you're going to have good days and you take two steps forward and you're going to have bad days where you take three steps back. But as long as you know where you're heading, when you come out of this crisis, it's like a sailboat. I'm not a sailor, but I know you put the rudder in and you attack back and forth because you want to get to your location. Um, think of it from that standpoint. Um, but that's one of the biggest pieces of advice uh, I, I give folks. And you know, amongst other things that you're doing in the near term, right? Because, you know, many businesses that were focused before the pandemic <clears throat> on long-term growth, now you're thinking a lot around short-term and how to protect liquidity and doing all the things you need to do and keeping your management and team together, uh, making sure, you know, you get intelligence on a, on a daily basis, you can act fast. But, you know, one of the other really important things as you as you go through that is give yourself perspective and just over communicate with your organization 
there's that great saying, you know, communication only happens in the eye of the, of the beholder. And so, you know, that daily feed or, or bi-weekly feed or whatever the appropriate amount is to give your folks context, context for what is going on, where is the company, celebrate the small wins is just so important in a, in a time of uh, uncertainty. When, when you think about the, this particular crucible, and, I, and before we lose Hubert and Hortense, I wanted to have them weigh in on this question too, because Mark, it really provoked a, uh, uh, an important concept there about self-awareness and, and avoiding self-delusion and communicating, over-communicating with people. Uh, Hubert, just before you arrived, was talking about writing a book around purpose and redefining what purpose means. One of the questions we got from a, a nearby in, in, uh, who's in the audience today who's in India today, was talking about the, the natural conflict between shareholder value and the being an empathic leader. Or is it really a conundrum and a, and a conflict? And uh, maybe we start with you, Baron, and then come back to Mark. So Mark, uh, I've learned many years ago from a client that 98% of the questions that are asked us either or are better <laughs> answered as ends. Should we take care of the short term or the long term? Both. Should we take care of the employees, all the customers, all the shareholders? And my personal experience is that if you take this point of view, good things happen. One, you waste less time on questions that are actually not very useful because, of course, you need to take care of both. And the truth is that in the best companies, the best performance is achieved when you simultaneously focus on doing great things for customers doing great, that are driven by great things done by the employees, and you treat profit as an outcome. And at Best Buy, that's, as a case study, our share price went from $11 to $92 a month ago. Now it's at 70 or something like this. Uh, employee turnover went down uh, to in the stores to less than 30, about 30%, which in retail is extraordinary. Customer satisfaction and revenue per customers went up. Our cost went, went down. Our relationship with our vendor partners has blossomed. As you know, in the Best Buy stores, you know we have stores within the stores. We have partnership with the world's foremost tech companies, including Amazon. Amazon has a kiosk uh, in our stores, and we've done a, an exclusive partnership with Jeff Bezos, where we have is given us the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform to be embedded in smart TVs. And they're only sold at Best Buy or buy Best Buy on Amazon.com. And so by embracing a clear sense of pursuing a noble purpose, which in our case is not selling TVs, but enriching people's lives through, the, through technology by addressing key human needs and uh, embracing all of the stakeholders and treating people as the engine, at the center of, 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 the, of the company, that's how you achieve extraordinary results. And I think as often as you can, if you can refuse these zero-sum games, you're going to be better off. This is an expensive view of the world, and that's how I believe you actually do it. So, And shareholders, I've told our shareholders at Best Buy that the purpose of Best Buy was not to make money. It was a necessary outcome. And they said, no, we, we, we understand. And the idea that you're under short-term pressure from your shareholders that leads you to do the wrong things, that's in your head. Uh, Larry Fink, you know, the CEO of BlackRock, wants us to focus on the long-term and purpose. So it's in our head. These trade-offs are in our heads. We refuse them. And I, I find that I find that, son, that that I'm trained, or as many of us are trained, to have that zero-sum game. So it's the you're talking about what I was beat up by my professor at Stanford, Jim Collins, who wrote good to great and built to last, uh, was part of the slave labor working on his books, uh, as you are as a graduate student. And I kept on saying, here's a comparison set, this or that. And it was genius of the end versus the tyranny of the or. And this is something that Mark, uh, you're, you have now both at, after so many years as an operating executive and then in retail at Ford, and now with this constellation in private equity, how do you, uh, how do you respond to what, what Hubert is saying about uh, the genius of the end in this dimension, because there's such pressure on results at the yeah. same time. Well, I think uh, I agree with Uber. At the end of the day, <clears throat> unless you have a highly motivated and skilled workforce, 
you're not going to have highly motivated customers, right? So you have to make sure you have that. But I also want to think and put this in perspective of the crisis right now. Yes. Because we can have these high ambitions, but also at the same time, when your revenue is falling off 50, 60, 70 percent, you just can't you just can't sit and not do anything. And so, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, there's the needs of the individuals and the people and the employees uh, and associates in your company. And there's the needs of the business. And you can never get those things out of whack because I'm reminded of a, uh, a quote. Um, I can't remember who said it, but they said only a profitable company can be of service to society. And, you know, from that standpoint, I think, you know, as you look at this crisis, this is a great opportunity for, for CEOs to think about this as not just a restart of the business, but a reset of the business and being able to prepare for the changed world and understand what does that mean for your business, for your customers, for the industry landscape. And it's a great opportunity to ask questions, really tough questions of yourself, of your company, like, is this the the time now to exit unprofitable product lines? Uh, Should we be divesting non-core businesses? Um, Should we exit or retreat from different regions of the world because you know, there's no opportunity to ever get to sustain profitable growth. And then finally, is it the time to make some personnel changes where you're, you're, you're putting in some folks who have real high potential and see how they do in a really tough environment. And so being able to take, you know, that old saying, never waste a crisis, you know, asking yourself the tough questions. And if you decide to do that and it requires you to take actions in the company, whether it's having to say goodbye to employees or different parts of the business, you can put it into perspective for them on how this positions the business for the future while being very respectful and fair to the folks that are going to be affected of the units or the businesses that are not going to be part of this business going forward. So, you know, it is, it's not a, it's not an or solution the employees or the business has to be and, but you have to put it in the context of the the crisis that you're facing and can you give context for folks so it doesn't just come across as a slash and burn. The, um, yes, can I say something? Please. And Mark, uh, Phil, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I've admired, you know, what what you've done. I'm here. Many many of us are fans of what you and and Adam Malali did at uh, at Ford. a profitable, only a profitable company can serve society. I think only a company that serves society can be profitable. Uh, it's, the two statements are true. And to build on what you're saying, of course, there's the realities of the, uh, of the world. To the extent that we can be driven by a noble purpose in what we do, and treat profit as an outcome and not as the primary function to optimize. And I, you know, at Best Buy, I sold businesses, I've closed businesses. So you need to do some of this, but it's an angle. And I think as we look at the future, the post COVID-19 environment, and we try to reset, if we're just driven by financials, and I'm not saying you were saying this, but I want to use what you said as a, as a platform. Uh, we're going to be a smaller company. Uh, it's going to be a lot of smaller companies. I think if we go back to why do we exist and reinvent the ba- the business on that basis, then we can grow companies. As an example, and then Mark uh, Thompson, I'll shut up and leave. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at Best Buy, we said our purpose is to enrich lives through technology by addressing key human needs. This is what has led us to begin a new business, focus on aging seniors, helping aging seniors live at home longer independently, which with the benefit of this crisis, you say, oh my God, that's a great idea. So we put sensors in their homes and with uh, remote monitoring and artificial intelligence, we can monitor their activities of daily living and then trigger an intervention if they don't uh, drink enough, not sleep well, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And we're saving lives by doing this. That's a service that's not sold in a store uh, it's sold in partnership with insurance companies. And that's a huge growth opportunity for us. We came up with it because we were driven by the sense of purpose with customers. 
And so uh, my conviction is that if we start with purpose and see people, as you said, Mark, as the engine of the business, then we can do great things. And yes, from time to time, we'll make up this decisions. You know, yeah, I think, I, yeah. I, I, completely, I completely agree with that. Listen, at the end of the day, your sense of purpose is so important in good times, just as it is in, is in bad times. And to your point, at Ford, when we went through this you know, massive restructuring, we, we, our purpose was very simple. It was come to Ford not to make the latest and greatest car, or truck, or design the best interior. It was come and help us change the way the world moves. And that is timeless. That's timeless when things are good. That's timeless when things are bad. Yeah. And to your point, Robert, it's also always understanding the customer and the macro trends. And as you see changes, is your purpose and your business uniquely positioned to help satisfy that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Well, well put. Um, and that sense of driving purpose and the mission of the organization is something that you become a steward of as you transition in your role, Hubert, to become a director and executive chairman. Mark, in your role of evangelizing and coaching so many companies in the portfolio. Uh, and Mark McLaughlin has, has joined us, uh, who was CEO of Palo Alto Networks, um, an iconic company that uh, impacted the world from Silicon Valley, although it looks like you're in Switzerland today, or maybe that's that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and now is chairman of the board at Qualcomm, uh, another company that has certainly faced a set of crucibles um, in the last few years, taking both a leadership role in transforming communications technology. And at the same time, Mark, I mean, you've, you um, you know, assuming the role of, of chairman there at a time when there was um, quite a bit of a set of challenges that were uh, affecting Qualcomm, the semiconductor industry, um, and, and feuds within the industry and, and, and outside and so forth. Um, welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to meet Hubert and Hortense before, but uh, I'm glad to get a chance for you guys to uh, virtually connect again. Thank you, thanks Mark for having me, and Hubert, it's nice to meet you, a fan of yours, and uh, Mark Fields and I, we go uh, way back on the Qualcomm board together, so you have got really two great guys here. They've been for the, the, you've been there for a very long time in in many of the transformations and the crises that the, that Qualcomm has faced. How would you characterize, we were talking earlier at the beginning of this program, anyone who tells us that they've been through a situation like this one is um, not being completely genuine. Uh, you all have had the distinction of having to face both existential crises and also transformations in businesses. How would you characterize um, what the, our current circumstances are in terms of uh, the way you're thinking about the business and, and governance of, of Qualcomm? Well, sure, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, to use the words unprecedented or whatever the uh, extraordinary, right, or these are absolutely the right adjectives to apply to the situation. I think if you have to go way back in time, you know, to find anything like uh, today and it, from a business perspective, even if you went back to the you know, Spanish influence of 1918, the world's not nearly as connected. Um, or wasn't then as it is today, right? So things are, um, it's an extraordinary circumstance and the interconnected as the world is at a level that's never uh, seen before. So um, truly global uh, in nature and the impact's gonna be, I think, pretty long and deep. I think from a company perspective, um, you know, we went from a period of, you know, maybe over two to three weeks time where, you know, most uh, CEOs and directors, whether it's public companies or private companies, even more focus on this for private companies, of course, uh, we're talking about uh, what kind of impact do you think we might see on the business to um, what's the cash on the balance sheet? And those are two very, very different conversations and just shows how fast things change from, uh, you know, what's the impact? Are there things that we're going to be able to do competitively that are to our advantage? We can use this opportunity to our advantage to will we survive the situation as a cash you know, statement, right, cash flow statement. Um, even very big companies, depending on what kind of industry you're in. I can tell you, and Mark knows, you know, from, uh, you know, Qualcomm, one of the things that uh, we did right away, did this public network from the executive chairman, you know, stress testing um, cash flow. You know, both companies are extraordinarily healthy, have a lot of cash, so it's, uh, that may sound a little crazy, um, but to imagine that many, many companies are going to go into a period of, 
you know, the next six, nine, 12 months of down anywhere from, you know, 20 to 50% of sales is, uh, is not only, um, not only, uh, not crazy, it's highly probable no matter what your industry is. Right. So I think the, uh, the focus for directors right now has to be, um, a number of things like health and the safe health and welfare of the employees. Um, how do we uh, maintain as many employees as we can as long as possible? A lot of the objectives we just heard about, uh, you've heard Mark speak about. Uh, but in addition to that, um, you have to kind of go into the bare knuckles right now as to, you know, um, what's this actually going to look like? What's cash flow break even look like? Right? And uh, uh, do we have enough cash in the balance sheet? Do we raise cash? You know, what are your what are your debt covenants right now? Like, these are the questions that people are actually asking in the corporate. So those are the right ones to ask. When you think about the, the fact that we have people who are in the room virtually right now across the globe who are participating in programs through Sloan and MIT, some of them are just getting started. Some of them are just getting finished. Others are mid-career. And uh, it looked like a, a sure thing to be able to just transition and lead in the workforce. And now you have a set of challenges that are so unprecedented. You've got all these experienced people on this call who've had decades, who've gone through many crucibles and we've never faced the same thing. What's, what, how would you have them think about um, the, the work they're doing and, and the, the way they should be crafting their career? At, at this point, you've coached so many people, you've been through many crucibles, and I think even you and your, your spouse met at West Point. So you both know, you both know discipline and adversity and engineering and, um, and how to work the problem. I'd, I'd love for you to characterize that as stepping into their shoes for a moment. Yeah, I guess the, the advice would be, and this all sounds kind of trite, but it would be the case is to uh, be flexible um, and not have uh, predetermined um, ideas as to what you're going to do, what you thought you're going to do. And, you know, for my personal professional career, I can think of three examples of uh, when the world changed very dramatically. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the plans that I had and the organizations that I was involved with literally went out the window, you know, and you just had to kind of start over with the new set of assumptions of the cards of the world thought you. The first one was actually right out of, uh, right out of West Point, was uh, just joined the army, um, you know, one year later, the Berlin Wall came down, um, the, 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 one of the largest intelligence failures in the history of the United States did not actually see that coming as fast as it came. My point on that, like, if you're in the, if you're in the military, then in the army, Everything we were doing, 100% of everything we were doing was to uh, about fighting the next war with the Russians at the Volga Gap, you know, in, in Germany. And then overnight, that was just over. Like, you talk about having a giant organization called the DOD Search for a Purpose, right, in 1989. And it was really, really interesting to be, uh, you know, uh, just joining that organization at that time and to see uh, everybody going through uh, all this analysis as to what's our purpose in life, you know, what are we going to do next? Then, you know, the next thing for me is the dot-com bust. Um, I had a lot of uh, things happening in my personal career right then that um, I just raised money in the company, um, all, everything was up and to the right, and then, you know, overnight, you know, the whole thing ended. And we had to come up with an entire new uh, entire new program, whole reason to exist, new value proposition for customers. And then the 2008 financial crisis um, as well, and um, you know, lots of uh, you know, lots of companies, lots of entities, and lots of people kind of you know washed out in there. You know, Warren Buffett's got a great saying. He says, you know, you only know who's naked when the tide goes out, right? <laughs> and uh, that's the situation now. Like the tide's going out. We're going to find out a lot of businesses that uh, that are just uh, they just don't deserve you know actually uh, be in that business, regardless of what they're their motives or missions may be, but um, at the end of the day, you know, businesses require you know, customers and profitability and all the things that uh, you'd be familiar with. But all that would say, like, at least in my, you know, if you just use that time frame, so in the last 30 years, you know, three giant and transformative events um, that uh, had a direct impact on me. And in each case, you know, the only thing that really kind of worked out was to stay flexible, uh, look for the opportunities where it existed, don't look at the past, just deal with the reality with the, with the present is uh, today. You get a much better shot at, you know, of, uh, of capitalizing on these. these there, there will be a lot of opportunity here. Um, I hate to say that when you have a crisis, but the reality is there will be a lot of opportunity from a business perspective or professional perspective. You just have to identify it. Well, when you had to step through those crises, which everyone here 
uh, who we've, we've invited today. You're all mentors of mine, and, and I uh, certainly treasure the, the insights that you give uh, around this. And, and you've, you've cited in the past how every time you've come through a crucible, you have further changed perhaps the way you show up for customers uh, or innovated or found ways. I, I think we're about to be entering another unprecedented era of potential innovation. We're on, a, we're on the ultimate world race for humanity right now, uh, pointing all of our, our, our resources in one direction with, with hundreds of companies all focused on trying to deliver uh, a new level of immunity. Um, if if, if a, a small startup tomorrow could, can, could disrupt uh, a big company today, or if there was a new model, what would be some of those that you would imagine? I'm, I'm getting this question from our friend Byron Laughlin, who is uh, head of uh, one of the, the leaders of governance uh, at NASDAQ, um, saying, you know, what, what, are, what are some of the opportunities for the people in the room right now um, to think about that might emerge uh, from, from your guesstimate and having been a technologist who's been disrupting for a very long time? Um, the, sure. You know, I'd say, um, my answer to that would, it would be the same as it would have been three months ago with one exception. One exception would be with COVID. Um, there's going to be uh, a number of things that are, I think, inevitably going to happen with this. Um, you know, one will be the, a very, very strong focus on the supply chain integrity um, mm. writ large, right? Um, so, uh, and that, that specifically goes to China on this, and it's for every single industry. Which would be right now, everybody is seeing. Um, whatever the supply chain tension was or dependency was in the states. And that's for every industry, I can tell you for sure it is in the technology industry. It turns out there's only so many things made, you know, uh, that you need and most of them are made in China. And uh, when they were more closed down than open uh, they are today, that was impacting everybody. And that's the case absolutely in healthcare. Lots of these uh, vaccines are being worked on, healthcare, even equipment, um, supply chain leads to China, right? So, I think there's going to be a very, very big rethink as to um, supply chain dependence in every industry, and specifically in healthcare. Um, so there, so the uh, um, you know the, the deck chairs are going to change there a lot. You know, and I don't know what that all means, but there's going to be a lot of opportunity inside that. But aside from that, which is very specific to the pandemic, the answer would have been the same, which is. Um, if I had to, if I had to sit here and say, let me guess, you know, what's going to be important in ten years from today, um, it's going to be SaaS, um, it's going to be cloud, you know, it's going to be uh, biotech, uh, it's going to be um, um, virtual reality, right? right? So, oh, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I meant by right? biomedicine, and, and uh, for my own, you know, young adult children, I tell them all the time, um, part of life. And success in life and business is just being associated at the right thing at the right time. <laughs> it's, it's it's hard enough to be it's hard enough to be you know to have success in business. So um, at least if you're on the, the trend, well, you, you know you've got a much better shot because all those things will grow dramatically. And if you go to where the growth is, you got a much better shot of being associated with something that would be very dialed into the growth. I would add cybersecurity in there as well, not because of call the networks, but um, that is. That's something that is only going to grow in importance, you know, for the next uh, decade of time. So that would be my advice: would be like, you know, if you kind of kind of get yourself into the mix of the things that are pandemic aside, these things aren't going away. Um, there are thematic um, uh, changes that are really really important. The, um, the the patterns that emerge in a in a period of disruption are something you've been in the forefront on. That that was part of what you did at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, it's certainly what what's happening with 5G at, at Qualcomm and so forth. I guess communication also in telecom and, and other ways of creating connectivity would be some of the other areas that you think might emerge uh, yeah. and accelerate? Yeah, I think, um, you know, from a, a 5G perspective, and this isn't a Qualcomm commercial, it's just more about uh, whether I didn't do it with Qualcomm or not, 5G is already going to be important. And it's absolutely going to be more important faster as a result of the pandemic. Um, because everything that we're trying to do right now, virtually and at distance, including telemedicine, for example, automation um, happened at a much better, faster, richer pace with 5G than without it. So mm -hmm. I think it's just triple underline the importance of getting that technology um, to market. The technology exists, it's really the applications. 
and then the infrastructure changes that have to occur to use the technology. That's what has to happen, and I think we'll see a very big focus on rolling those out on a global basis, uh, more so than we did before this pandemic. Mm -hmm. The um, the the sense of of acceleration of change. A lot of you, all of you, actually have mentioned at some level how this is a time when we have to get reconnected with what's important to us, and then re then connect it to how we can serve others where we can have impact. And the technology being a facilitator of that, being a, the connective tissue, that we aren't the, the producers of profit, we are those who are trying to create a dividend that's a profit that comes when we serve at a higher level of purpose. And, and that coming out of this crisis, uh, many of those changes or opportunities actually are accelerated in unprecedented ways. We just had join, joining us a, a, another mentor of mine, uh, in addition to our two Marks and Hortense and Hubert. And, and thank you all for indulging me because I, I started this conversation about how I need a lot of help. And all of us always do uh, throughout our lives and career. And it comes from coaching and mentoring from people like you who've had a front row seat uh, your entire lives. And, and you've always had a great community of advisors as well. Um, so you've, you've role modeled that. Nobody does anything worthwhile alone. And we have joining us Enrique Lores, who's the newly appointed CEO of Hewlett Packard, HP Inc. Uh, and uh, Enrique uh, signed up at a time when he might also ask himself, like many of you in this room, what did I sign up for? Because uh, he has been had the opportunity to be thrown into a series of transformations prior to COVID. Uh, over a five month period, I think you've had everything except for the locusts um, and, uh, and, and shareholders um, and uh, interested parties from all over the world. Uh, Enrique is, you can see him here if you happen to be able to observe him as I can. Uh, Enrique and, and I, I think the last time we had dinner outside together was in the backyard of the original garage uh, that we all think about when you say Silicon Valley. There was a, an actual garage. It's a one car garage and it's the screen share that Enrique has behind him right now. And we, we had a dinner in the backyard where we had chief executives sitting in a circle talking about how we really wanted to show up for this next leg of the race, um, how we wanted to continue to reinvent ourselves and get advice from each other in new ways. And Enrique, you really impressed me as a person after decades serving in regions around the world how well tuned you are into the cultures and the diversity and the, 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 the differences that bring us together uh, in the ways that you want to reinvent uh, HP. Uh, you heard the last question, I think, because you joined us a, a moment ago, and I'd love for you to weigh in about how you're thinking uh, about taking a, an iconic brand, an iconic company that really is the, the, uh, the origin of what we call Silicon Valley uh, and taking that yet into its next uh, set of generations uh, going forward. Thank you for being along, Enrique. Uh, thank you, Mark. And actually, it was it was great listening to Mark because it was like if he had been in our board because many of the conversations he was describing are actually the same conversations and same discussions we have been having in our board during the last two or three months. So clearly, Many companies are reacting to the current situation in a similar way, and we, are, and we are all facing similar issues, similar dilemmas, and we are probably making similar calls as well. In our case, what, what we did when the crisis started is we realized that we didn't have a recipe for this. This is something that you don't learn in school. There are notebooks. And we thought that the only way to really manage the situation was to focus on our values, really make sure that we stay true to our values and use them to guide us and to guide in any decision we have made. And we have been using two key principles during all this time. First, we think that this is the worst situations are the right time to make the right decisions. And we have been really focused on that. And second, we have also looked at the, at the, at the crisis as an opportunity to do better. And based on these two things, we have both defined our short-term reactions, but are also looking at what do we need to change in the company to be a better company when all this is over. Mm. Because what it is clear is that this crisis will be over at some point. The only question is how strong every company will be when this happens. 
And I think all of us want our companies to be stronger when, when all of this is, is finished. Mm. When you think about the, the theme of being stronger and redefining it, it's interesting how, while we often talk about reinvention along the way, I don't know about you, but I've not always had the courage to take the advice that I needed to continue to grow or develop new skills or do a better job of connecting uh, with my customers. And, and, you know, a body block like this one is one that is hopefully a wake up call uh, to, to think about ways to do better um, and have maybe a little more moral courage because I have to, <laughs> to, to change. Talk about how uh, you've been helping uh, the organization change because it's gone through many, in a sense, many lives and it's, it's, and it's now serving in some unique ways. Yeah, I think actually this situation is a call for action. And we are being we are using this to really identify that over time will grow. And at the same time, what do we think that we need to stop doing because the world is moving in a very fast, but also a different direction to where we thought it was gonna be moving six months ago. In our case, for example, the fact that people will be working from home and also working from the office is a great opportunity to redefine what the experience of using a PC or using a computer is, where really you need to design that for someone that one day will be working in the office, working from home. This is clearly a big opportunity for us. We have also been working for some time in 3D printing and digital manufacturing. This current crisis is showing how important these technologies could be in a world where supply chain will, only, will not only be defined by cost, but will be defined by cost and resiliency. And all companies are gonna be looking for more flexibility. So we are looking both at the portfolio, changes we do in the portfolio, but also at changes that we do in how do we work internally. We are looking for ways to really flex, make, be, make it more flexible for employees to work from the office, work from home, which opens an opportunity of redefining our real estate footprint, which for companies like us, it's a very, very significant investment. We are looking at our supply chain, and Mark was mentioning this before. We have a supply chain defined in a very stable environment where we could make decisions that really help us to reduce cost. If we think about a world where there will be trade tensions, there might be impact from climate changes, we could be facing similar health crises in the future. We need to balance the change the balance between cost and increase resiliency as we redefine supply chain. It's a big, big effort for us. And at the same time, when we think about how do we reach customers, how do we go to market, clearly traditional channels are being very significantly impacted. Even companies like Best Buy are reshifting their focus towards online. And this is something that for vendors like us is another big change that we need to accelerate and that we need to drive. So. Again, the crisis is an opportunity of redefining our portfolio, but also how do we work and some of the key core decisions we'll be making in the next weeks and months are really gonna be driven by this need to change and this needs to adapt. I think about the discussion. The, you yes, just you mentioned did. Best Buy as the uh, executive chairman of Best Buy and having gone through the journey over the last few years. If there's anything I can do with selling a lot of your products, is they completely agree with you that Home office equipment is uh, is a big is a big trend. And, uh, anything I can do for you? Thank you. The uh, the opportunity the, that you just represented just now about uh, partnership. Um, I'm seeing the emergence. I don't know about everyone here uh, who has been in contact with organizations during this crisis. I know that's certainly true for Hortense and and both Marks and. Uh, and for Hubert, um, Enrique has talked about this with me many times in the past about finding and redefining competition and partnerships uh, and, and looking at a changing landscape of who we partner with, uh, where there's coopetition, um, a healthy way of continuing to grow together and partnering in, at scale uh, in new ways. Um, and could you Mark, there was a question in the chat room about how should we think about competition in this time of crisis? Should exactly. we try to push them or not? And one of the thoughts I would offer, and I'd be interested to see what others are, think, are thinking, is that an, a, an excessive focus on competition is actually not healthy. Being driven, like Enrique just did, on 
what are we what problem are we tr tr trying to solve in the world and so being incredibly driven on what purpose we're pursuing and what we're trying to do for customers and then looking at how we can creatively partners with others is a much healthier uh, approach than a zero sum it's back to zero sum games let's yeah. focus on solving problems partnering with others and then from time to time, you know, if we need to crush a competitor, we'll do it. But it's not, <laughs> it's not the primary driver. It's much better to be focused on solving problems for the world, I would say. And I think we are seeing that in, in two different things. One is in how do we redefine our business going forward? And I think all companies have realized that our businesses will have to change. And in periods of change, everybody's more open to see what others are doing and to partner and collaborate in different ways. But also this is opening opportunities to collaborate as we look for a way to support our communities. I think when we see the, the impact that the crisis is having in the healthcare system in many different countries in the world, many companies have stepped up and used their resources to really help their communities. And this is also this has also created new relationships, new connections, and easily helping many customers, many companies to show their values and to show really to the world that we are here to create value for our shareholders, but also to have a much bigger impact in the communities we serve. I love that. You're talking about really expanding what we might traditionally think in business as collaboration. Uh, and in, in new ways where we're having to step up for communities. And that's, that, that's, that's very helpful. I, I know that, that uh, Mark McLaughlin and, and Mark Fields, you're both at Qualcomm at a time when um, the new types of partnerships had to be formed as well, um, that you needed to look to ways that you could really empower um, those partnerships. How, did you, do you see that changing going forward too? And, and how's that changed for you? Mark, I'm not here to jump in first. No, go ahead, Mark. You're the chairman. I'll follow up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for sure. And, um, you know, events like this aside, um, things change you know, over time. So I think, uh, you know, Qualcomm's a great example of a business that, uh, you know, uh, was high into the right, you know, on the strength of uh, smartphones. And, uh, and then that just changed, you know, I want to say overnight, but pretty damn quickly about five years ago with the rise of uh, low end manufacturers in China. The rise of uh, OEMs, uh, the whole space just changed very, very quickly. Yeah, and so you can have an impact like that that um, uh, maybe you should see it coming, but it comes very quickly. And that changes your entire ecosystem, including the supply chain ecosystem and who are your, who are your friends, who is your uh, competition and co uh, competition very, very quickly. Um, you know, you see an event like this pandemic, you know, a good friend of mine uh, who's kind of seen his business go from a very good business to, you um, a business you can't do without is Eric over at Zoom. Right? So, talking to him a month ago, he's very happy running his business. A good one is growing nicely, you know, and uh, now, you know, it's the, the center of the world, right? So, uh, you know, it, it can go either way. Right? But you have to be, uh, you have to be on your, on the, your toes all the time as to whichever way it's going to go, who can help you in that, and also watch what we can hurt. Yeah, the only other thing I would add, um, and this is really to Avera's comment, is, yeah, that first question you always ask yourself, that strategy question is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then the second most important question, I believe, is, well, what do you have to believe as a company to be successful in solving that problem? And that may lead you to, do I have to grow expertise internally? If I can't do that and time is of the essence, then maybe it makes sense to partner with uh, a partner who brings that expertise and complements the, the expertise that you're bringing to that. But those two questions, you actually have to ask those questions and ping pong back and forth between them. Uh, because if you're not asking, what do you have to believe? And you know, you start uh, detaching yourself to reality sometimes and making promises that you can't deliver. <laughs> it's a good point. You know, uh, I think about you, uh, each of your careers and Enrique, knowing that that um, you what, you've been with the organization and seen an entire arc of transformations through HP during your lifetime. How have you collaborated uh, to ascend to the next level in an organization? Because 
uh, as our, our good friend Marshall Goldsmith told us, what got you here won't get you there. Um, how, how have you been coached and, and how have you collaborated uh, as you have gone through the various changes uh, in your career? I think a, a very important thing is to be able to get a trustworthy relationship with your peers and with your teams. And I think this is even more important in a situation like the one we are going through. Mm. People need to have confidence on you, need to trust what you say, which means you need to be very transparent, very direct, very honest. And this is difficult in a period of time when, like now, from one perspective, we want to show optimism to the organization about the opportunities that we see. But we also need to acknowledge that we are going through a very difficult situation and some tough decisions are going to be necessary in the in the next months. And being able to maintain both a clear tone supporting that and driving the organization and bringing the organization with you is something fundamental. And I think it's something as you grow in any organization, you really need to build because at the end, the value that we bring is the value of bringing our teams with us. Make sure that they have confidence in the direction that we are taking and that trust what we are going to be doing in the future. Hortense, uh, who wrote a book called Aligned, uh, Enrique, uh, was talking about that at the opening, where that, that alignment, uh, and, and Hubert was anchoring this as well, saying that you know if the, if the first thing is that we have to cut uh, our way to survival, we won't have the team that we need to lead us into the, the next chapter or have the remarkable level of uh, innovation that's necessary and confidence that's necessary to, to come up with the next idea. Enrique, when you've collaborated in the past and you've had a new technology, I think about 3D, for example, that had some traction um, mm -hmm. and now has had some mission criticality to it in the way that Mark McLaughlin just talked about Zoom. Um, could, could you share a little bit about how that comes about with collaboration? Because the problem I found with innovation, and it's the innovator's dilemma, uh, usually we don't welcome, uh, or success isn't always the great teacher, right? Um, it can be difficult and we often reject new ideas. Hopefully in a crisis we become better able to, to hear some input that might be imaginative. Uh, how would you talk about how you collaborate for innovation? I think in this case is to, to acknowledge that big changes like what Mark was talking before with G5 on what we're trying to do with 3D printing cannot be driven by a company alone and mm. require a full ecosystem of partners, mm. a full ecosystem of companies supporting that. In the case of 3D, we need to collaborate with designers of products because we will want 3D to be adopted by the manufacturing industry we need to work with the designers of cars that are now designing cars that will be sold five years ago from now. We need to work with providers of materials that will be created, that will be used to create the parts. We need to work with software providers. So it's really a full ecosystem that you need to drive and that you need to energize and support and put behind the direction that we are trying to do. And it's really about showing the value that we can create for our customers Mm. As Mark was saying before, really focus on the problem that we are trying to solve and why we can really have a big impact because uh, the solution we are bringing to market has much more, we, we drive much more value to customers. I love and that. I think the current situation is actually helping to show how many of the things that we have been talking about now are becoming real. It's a great example of the flexibility some of the, that some of these new technologies are, mm. are bringing to the market. Mm -hmm. Forcing them at a higher rate. I've been integrating some questions that I've gotten through the chat box as we've been going here that have helped amplify the, the many great points that, that all of you have talked about just now. And one of the questions we got from Nelson was, many companies have been discussing the kind of workplace of the future, which we've been accelerated into now, and how automation and AI will affect that that future workforce. Do you think that it's a time, as he says, to think in in terms of how we include employees, especially lower uh, level employees, uh, into the decision making process, how, how we can get the wellspring uh, of ideas and innovation from what we would describe as the lowest level to, to the highest level in an organization? That's always a hard thing to do. Actually, uh, absolutely, yes. Something we, we have seen 
happening during the last years that now will intensify is how important the opinion of employees when equipment is bought by companies has become versus what it was five years ago. Five years ago, for example, all decisions about PCs, printers were, were done by the IT department. And they bought and they decided what PCs to buy. Today, they listen to what their customers, whether employees want. And this is why if we think about how the design of PCs have changed, industrial design has become so important. Products being light has been become so important. And I think we are gonna enter now in a new phase, which is not only about the equipment that we provide to the office, it's really about how do we support customers and employees to work more effectively from home. What type of solutions do we need to provide? What type of experiences do we need to provide? For us, this is really within the crisis, is really opening this opportunity and actually accelerating many changes that probably were gonna happen also, but now will be happening in one year versus probably five or six years before. Mm -hmm. How, how would others among you of our guests, esteemed guests, talk about how you let the, that, the information flow from, as Enrique is saying, that's the microphone we have in front of the customer who's suffering and struggling with our user interface, struggling with our service, the point of contact who we usually in, in, instinctively in the past had maybe listened to last is now the first person we're listening to. How, how have you all thought about think, that? Okay, there's, there's, two, there's two parts in this question. One is how do we involve the employees in particular the frontliners but at all levels in you know the formulation of the strategy the decision making and then sh there's a separate question which is should employees be on the board of directors <laughs> on the first part i would say absolutely yes that's essential you know the the in the 20th century the model was you take smart people you know they work on the strategy they come up with the strategy you come up with an implementation plan you cascade it down you put incentives in place and hope it works. That model doesn't work at all anymore. So co-creation of the strategy, listening to people on the front line, giving them the autonomy to do uh, to make a lot of decisions and pushing decision making as far down as, as possible. There's many ways to do this. I think it starts with helping everybody at the company connect what drives them with the purpose of the of the company. And then if you do that, then sort of all sorts of magical things happen. As relates to the board, I think it's a very different question. I don't believe, and, it, and the law depends a little bit on the state, and certainly things vary around the world. My personal conviction is that the, the responsibility of the board should not be on primarily the shareholders, but it should integrate all of the stakeholders and you know the, the the pursuit of the noble purpose of the company and how to create value for all of the stakeholders. So I'm a big believer in stakeholder capitalism, and the law in most states here in the U.S. does not prohibit that. In fact, I think the Delaware law is um, is, is is very true. So the idea that the board is an agent of the shareholders, I think, is philosophically wrong. Uh, having a great board is a great asset for a company, uh, and the fact that you pick board members who are uniquely qualified to help the company and the management team, you know, drive to the next level, I think is the right approach. And uh, in the same way that, I mean, boards today are independent, only the CEO is on the board and, and that's made to make her happy, not really to, you know, <laughs> because you want the best possible outside board you can. And the idea that the board members should be representatives of the various stakeholders I think it's, it would be a mistake. You want them to look at things uh, holistically. So two different answers, because I think there's two parts of the question. I think the, before the crisis started, this the debate between shareholders and stakeholders was starting to become very fundamental. Yes. I think this crisis is just gonna accelerate and yeah. confirm the change. Yeah. I, I think when, when we think about the impact companies have in communities, in societies, in the world, they cannot be only focused on creating shareholder value. It's really the combination of shareholders, employees, and communities, what we all need to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's uh, interesting how history kind of repeats itself. Um, 
you know, just on a, I, I, for, for what it's worth, you know, I used to be a, a lawyer and uh, I find this kind of uh, interesting right now and everybody's living through it, whether they realize it or not. It's kind of a fundamental shift in um, views of society as to the, what you just said and Enrique just said, which is uh, where is the duty, of, you know, where is the duty, right? <laughs> the, uh, just, it is still today um, the fundamental legal position that the um, duty of the company is to shareholders for profitability, full stop. That's the legal definition of the United States today. And uh, no, that's true. And uh, what we're seeing now is, um, you know, whether the concept of what's right for the shareholders goes beyond um, maximizing profits, right? And so that's what we're seeing is sort of, and it's really interesting, it's playing yourselves out in us. It's not the first time it's happened in the United States. It's happened before, right? And it kind of goes back and forth over time. And, uh, you know, fundamentally behind that, I think, is kind of the failure of government. Um, to do a number of things that society would expect government to do and it hasn't done that. So now it's uh, some of the, I'll call that the burden and the responsibility and the opportunity is being shifted into the corporate world. And um, which in some cases are gladly taking up that baton. In other cases, there are a company like College Networks, you know, 90% of customer support um, questions are actually answered by other customers to them, not even our customer support organization, right? Um, you have organizations like Cable, which is, uh, you, know, you can you can open source or community source um, questions about um, uh, you know uh, artificial intelligence or or algorithms and you know they almost always will outperform your internal um, team of, of who you hire and pay a ton of money to come up with good algorithms. Seventy two hours, the community will come up with a better one for you if you let them do that. Right. So there are just a whole bunch of examples, including employee communication upstream as to um, where the technology is there to crowdsource um, answers, you know, for, for folks. I think the thing you have to be careful with is kind of like um, trying, it's like trying to run the, the, the country based on uh, social media rights. Like you don't want to, you can't make, I, I didn't mean that as a political comment, it's more of like no matter who is in charge, it's, it's very difficult to run anything when the turnaround time or what the expectation of the answer is, is 10 seconds. <laughs> yes. So if an organization is telling you this afternoon something's not right, um, you'd be wise to wait till a week from today before you actually thought about that you did something, as opposed to trying to you know, call, you react every 10 minutes, right, to whatever the, the current feedback is. So you have to kind of you know, use the technology to be kind of careful about the, what your, your thoughtfulness uh, and reaction time is on. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I, uh want to make sure that we hear from Mark and, and Hortons to, to close this discussion and also be respectful of the fact that a number of people here have to make it to the next class um, at the top of the hour. So I know some of you may have to go. Uh, I wanted to, to thank all of you for these insights during a time when I think we need each other even more. Uh, we need the we need the advice, we need the support, the collaboration and partnership and also the help in being self-aware of how we can grow and, and change uh, and develop those skills and show up for this next leg of the race in a, in a new way. Uh, Mark and Hortense, did you want to add something before we close? Um, oh. Yeah, uh, Mark, do you want to come? Okay. No, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, I think that, you know, uh, uh, we, we talk about the purpose and we talk about, you know, our why and what drivers. I think this driver, the why and the purpose is really the glue uh, between uh, the head and all the company. So between you as a leader and all the company. And I think this is to connect with them. Uh, this is the best way uh, to do it. So just is you know, what we said today and everybody uh, said, I think it's the same thing. So it's so important to, uh, to really understand your why, your purpose, your driver, and what you want, you know, what you believe in, and to connect with others. So this is, I think, the main point I would, I would today. And, and, and ask people, you know, we're talking about including people uh, out there in your, empl uh, including your employees and ask them a uh, question and what they think. I think that today um, we have to maybe open and go out of the box. So, and think differently, uh, listen more to intuition and everything. So I think that 
you know, talking with with different people and asking uh, everybody in, in the company or the employees, not maybe everybody, but I mean, including as much as people that, as, as you can, uh, could be a um, very, um, very good way to, um, to share different ideas and maybe came up with different things. So, and uh, this is my experience from my, 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 my coaches and my CEOs and, and using the platform they have to think differently. So if you're doing now, you have a manufacturer to do that, 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 maybe, okay, with that, can, can we do things differently? And can we, you know, how can we work with different people? And, and um, so this is what I think, sorry, I'm very long. <laughs> no, absolutely, Mark? Just one last thought, you know, you asked the point earlier about, you know, how you manage your way through this as a, as a leader. And this is a bit like running to the fire. And my only advice is I've gone through a number of these. This will, going through a crisis, you are gonna grow exponentially and the fastest you have when you go through a crisis. And so when you think about the other end that you come out of this, you're gonna grow professionally, you're gonna grow personally. And, 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 you know, I know it sounds kind of odd, but look at this as an opportunity, because when you look back on it, you will absolutely see it as such. I think that's uh, that's great insight. Thank you all for the amazing coaching. Thank you for mentoring me. Thank you for mentoring all of these extraordinary colleagues at the table today. Uh, Hortense, Mark, Mark, Enrique, thank you for being here. Congratulations on the new gig. Hubert, uh, thank you for the, the insights. Welcome to the folks across the street uh, in, <laughs> in the impact that you're having, as well as the incredible work you do at the Business Council uh, and at Ralph Lauren. Uh, thank you all uh, for gathering today. And thank you, Sloan Fellows and MIT, Sok May, Juliana, and others who put this together. I'm, I'm so honored to have been asked to come back. Thank you, Mark, you've been amazing. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much.